Jacobs. Uh, I'm an American historian of uh, science and technology. I live in Hiroshima. I study the history of nuclear technologies, nuclear weapons, nuclear power, nuclear testing, radiation explo exposures, and nuclear accidents. And I've been in Hiroshima for a little over 14 years. Uh, I'm a historian of science and technology. I study the history of nuclear technologies, nuclear weapons, nuclear power, uh, history of nuclear testing and radiation exposures around the world. And it's primarily a research, it's primarily a research institute. Um, so a lot of my work is essentially research and writing, um, but increasing amounts of teaching. Uh, and while I've been here, I also taught for a few years at Jogakwin High School in a special global studies course on uh, nuclear history. Um, and it, Hiroshima is the only place I've lived in Japan. And the day that I arrived here to take up my job was the first day I set foot in Asia. Wow. <laughs> and now you've, you've been all over the place. You've, yeah. You travel around quite often for talks and stuff, right? Yeah, I have. And also for field research. I've done uh, a lot of field research in places that are affected by radiation, which has brought me to uh, places that are not tourist destinations. You know, places like Kiribati in the Pacific or the Marshall Islands or Kazakhstan. Uh, places where nuclear testing or other nuclear incidents have happened, uh, but also to give conferences um, or to give talks at different places all around the world. So for me, uh, before, before I came here, I had, you know, I'm an American and I had traveled around America, but I'd only left America once. Outside of crossing the border into Canada or, or Mexico for a few days um, before I moved here, uh, and since I moved here, I've been, I've been able to travel the world through my work. It was not my plan to stay here this long, uh -huh. um, but it just turned out to be just the right place for me to do what I do. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to yeah. come over here to this wonderful place. Yeah. You've been to these buildings before? I have, just, just you know, to see them from the exterior. But mm -hmm. Not only yeah. are they a fantastic backdrop for things like this, yeah. where we have videos, but um, it's also a see, touch, and feel experience for anyone who wants to learn about Hiroshima's history, not only the bombing, yeah. but history longer yeah. than the bombing, because they're more than 100 years old. So wow. it was really fantastic. Four, so, something okay. like that. And that's why they're as intact as they are. Yeah, and I mean, you, you would know a lot more than me, but I found it really interesting how the, the doors over mm -hmm. the windows mm -hmm. are damaged in different mm -hmm. ways around the entire building. Sure. It's not just on the blast side. Mm -hmm. It's actually damaged all around different parts of the warehouse. Well, right. so the, the force, the heat and the force would be distributed fairly evenly, but the windows may have been in different positions, so they may have experienced it differently. Right. But the force and the heat wouldn't be very different from this window to that window. So the difference in what we see here probably reflects that they were in different positions when they experienced that force or that heat. I would say is that there's a lot of, I don't know about these specific buildings, but a lot of similar warehouse uh, or small factory buildings that were in this city at the time. A lot of the laborers were Korean laborers. And there's really no place here to learn about the history of the Koreans that were in Hiroshima and Nagasaki or in Hiroshima in this case and I could imagine included among other things could be a small museum to that history which would be a tremendous addition to the city uh, and expand its presentation of, uh, of the history of what happened on August 6th. Uh, youth engagement, uh, youth activities, art as you said, you know, spaces for artists, studio spaces for artists who can't afford quite to pay a full rent on an intact storefront or, or building. There's tons of stuff that could be done yeah. in the community, you know, community based or even things that would generate uh, that would generate income like, as you said, boutique hotel and, and restaurants because it's staying in a historical facility. Yeah. And so many of the people that come to Hiroshima come here to encounter that specific history. So spending your night inside a building that survived that, you know, sitting at the end of the day and having uh, a meal and one could imagine, you know, regionally sustainably grown food, kind of the, the way that uh, good quality gourmet food is these days. Um, 
inside a boutique hotel it would be the kind of thing that could easily draw a lot of tourists as a part of their Hiroshima experience. It's off from downtown, so there's a way in which they would experience the town in a little more of a genuine way than it less in a curated way, the way the downtown space is. Yeah, for so sure. A lot of stuff. And you come from a restaurant background, so you, yes. you know about the appeal of historical places in terms of Absolutely, you restaurants, bet. business, right? Yeah, and, and also of uh, in tourism, you know, one of the things that's one of the things that's so on the rise is, uh, you know, dark tourism. And, you know, one of the ways that people traveling to visit sites of historical trauma uh, and I've one of the ways I understand it is I, there's a religious studies scholar that mentioned to me that the rise of people participating in dark tourism almost tracks the decline in people participating in religious pilgrimage. So in some ways, it's it functions as a religious as religious pilgrimage sites for the modern world, which is that we go to places that from which the world we live in derive meaning and our understanding of what the world we lived in is. So people go to concentration camps or to the killing fields in Cambodia or to battlefields uh, or here to Hiroshima for example and so uh, that's part of the draw and um, and the people who are doing that are people who are often liking to have an when you encounter things that make you grapple with difficult history having some place to then relax and feel good and have a nice part of your day uh, a nice meal, you know, a nice drink at the end of the day, some community, some encountering other travelers. That's something that is a part of that journey, that tourism journey. And so having that all happen within the context of historical sites themselves is really appealing. Yeah, I think so too. And it's that, it's the human condition of loss. Yeah. And being able to be at a site where there's so much loss. Of course, everybody can relate to that on a certain level, and that that's part of the dark tourism appeal. And if you if you had a location like this, where you had local, you know, kids coming and learning about the bomb in a real mm -hmm. way, but also you had a lot of other community activities mm -hmm. and businesses, and everybody was kind of interacting in a more normal way, but the history was still there and tangible. Absolutely, and part of what that does is it reinforces the notion of uh, of resilience, you know, and the fact that here we are in this place where such pain occurred, but tonight we can meet people who are also traveling, we can have a lovely evening, we can hear local music, we can eat local food. It's a way of realizing that, yes, there's this trauma that happened here, there's all of this suffering that happened here, but look now at the life that's happening here, and look now at, at how human beings can reemerge from that and make community and share food together and listen to music together. So it's, in many ways, I think an essential piece that should accompany always dark tourism, which is encountering the vitality and the resilience and the uh, capacity of life to reemerge and to grow, you know, uh, just like here in Hiroshima, it was so important when flowers grew and plants grew, you know, that's what went seeing community grow, seeing encounters between people from different places is a way in which, yes, we encounter this dark past, but we're also encountering a present that's hopeful and gives us a sense of, uh, a, a sense of not what was lost, but what what couldn't be lost, what remained. And hope. Yeah. Hope for the future. Exactly. So I think that's uh, it can play an essential role like that. Yeah. Wonderful. So because it's over here, where nobody's going to come, well, it would be far more productive as a shopping center, or far more productive as high-rise apartments. Uh, you know, it would be uh, contributing much more to the city tax base. And we, if we are going to develop things related to uh, the, the nuclear attack for tourism purposes or for historical purposes, we're going to concentrate that at the city center, which is where we're, going to con where we're going to try to keep the tourists focused. But in terms of sustainable tourism, it makes a lot of sense to spread tourism out. Absolutely. You bet. <laughs> and there's a lot of benefit to having a site away from the city center. I agree. It would expand that zone and it would... People might stay at hotels near here. More hotels might develop near here. More restaurants might be busier near here. Yeah. But politicians are really short-term thinkers. Yeah.
And it's just, it's a very impressive building in yeah. terms of how it was made as well as its history. And it's very intact, seemingly, compared to some of the buildings that are closer to the you know, epicenter. You know, it seems like, you could, like it wouldn't be hard to get a lot done in, in turning this around into a really usable space. Yeah, for sure. Maybe next, we'll talk a little bit about your most recent article that you've done about um, Born Violent, which I thought was really sure. fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this, this article is, uh, is about the origins of nuclear power plants. Um, we often, we live with this, we're often promoted or given this narrative that uh, after the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and after the world faced nuclear weapons, that we then decided to find a peaceful use for this, uh, for this energy. Uh, and it was promoted as atoms for peace, you know, now let's have it be a helpful uh, a helpful energy, a helpful uh, thing rather than a threatening thing. And so this kind of narrative gives you the sense that we took this dark technology and found an application that was beneficial to human beings, creating electricity. Uh, and that's of course a myth um, because we invented nuclear power plants before we invented nuclear weapons. Nuclear power plants were invented by the Manhattan Project and they were not invented to make electricity, they were invented to make plutonium. Uh, this is how we make plutonium. We manufacture plutonium by operating nuclear power plants. That's incredible. When I, when I read that, and you were talking quite a lot about the Hanford facility. Yes. Right? Hanford in the United States, Hanford, Washington, this is where the first fully functional uh, modern you know, nuclear power, essentially a nuclear power plants were built. The very first reactor was the B. There were prototype reactors in order to develop the design and to, for people to gain some training. Uh, but the first really functional nuclear reactor was built at Hanford, Washington, the B reactor, and it began operating in 1944. Uh, and three reactors were built during the war, and all of them only manufactured plutonium. Uh, and Hanford remains one of the most radiologically toxic places on Earth to this day. It's certainly the most radioactive place in the United States, and a lot of that waste is being held, a lot of the waste that's being held there, it no longer produces plutonium. A lot of the waste that is held from the days of production uh, are leaking, and the ecosystem there has quite a lot of radiation loose in it. Uh, you talk so, about it being buried in the forest? Yeah, there was, there was uh, the U.S. government itself cataloged over 12,000 sites where, uh, uh, no, no, 1,500 sites, sorry, I got the number wrong, 1,500 sites where radioactive waste was just dumped in trenches. Uh, and so some of the particles, the, the, the different waste particles have different properties, different chemical properties, but some of them are very good at transporting. Some of them are very good at moving with water and being absorbed by plants. So for example, a lot of the brush that grows in Hanford, it's kind of high desert there in eastern Washington, a lot of the brush that grows there has radionuclides inside of them. And so as it's drier and drier and there's more and more wildfires, there's a risk that a wildfire will sweep across part of that reservation, burn those plants, which would aerosolize those radionuclides and distribute them downwind in smoke. And because many, many of them will remain dangerous for hundreds of years, uh, especially the ones that transport easily, uh, it's inevitable that this will happen. There's no way we're gonna keep wildfires from crossing. So we've had 20 wildfires or more that have been burning on the reservation in the past 30 years and it, with increasing frequency. So it's a matter of time, it's only inevitable that wildfires will, will burn through this land yeah. and this material will be re-released. Uh, so through smoke and then people would be affected. People would inhale it. And inhale it or in the ground or in the water, it, right? It, 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 people could inhale it, but it will also, or a lot of it will just land and then enter into the ecosystem downwind. Um, you know, there's no place in the world that doesn't have residual radiation from nuclear testing. Uh, every place on Earth has that. There was so much nuclear testing that uh, especially large thermonuclear weapons, H-bombs, the clouds go so high that a lot of the particles enter the stratosphere and they can circle the Earth for years before they deposit. That is crazy. So we use that, for example, uh, as a way to detect all kinds of forgeries. So if somebody has a painting and claims that this is a Van Gogh painting, 
uh, we can tell if that painting was painted after 1945 because there'll be traces of radiation in the fibers on the canvas and in the paint. Oh my God. And this is global. So, That's incredible. for example, here in Hiroshima and also in Nagasaki, there is more radiation present in the ecosystem from nuclear weapon testing around the world than there is from the original two attacks on those cities. Uh, there's really, in, in the mid 1950s, the United States did a study where they gathered the bones and teeth of 20,000 people uh, from cadavers and also from uh, the teeth of children when they lose their teeth. And um, this is and this was done globally so from australia from south america from all parts of the world and they found traces of fallout radiation in almost all the samples wow so there's uh and that will continue because we have all of these places that have a lot of radiation in them and think about uh fires in fukushima that transport that radiation uh it's so once you once these chemicals once these radionuclides enter into the ecosystem like any chemical they simply migrate through the ecosystem and they will remain dangerous until they're not dangerous for cesium-137 which is a big problem in fukushima and by chernobyl that's 300 years 300 years yeah so this idea of 30 years is not very accurate no it's it has to do with half-lives okay so basically a half-life is the period of time it takes for a particle to lose half of its radioactivity so in 30 years, it's not exact, right around 30 years for cesium-137, it will lose half of its radioactivity. Then in the next 30 years, it will lose half again of what was left. So typically it takes 10 half-lives for the particle to become essentially inert and not dangerous to us. So 30 years is a half-life for cesium-137, but you need 10 of those for it to not become dangerous. Thank you for explaining that. I think that is so confusing to people when they hear all these terms and they think they understand it, but there a lot of them are very counterintuitive, right? Sure. And radiation is a very hard thing to understand, so it's very easy to talk to people in a way that fogs, the, that makes them think, I can't understand this. Right. You can also make it clear if your goal is to communicate clearly, but if what you're trying to do is to manage people's anxieties, which is what governments do after radiological accidents, um, there's ways to talk about radiation that make people think, I, this is too complicated, I don't quite get what's the difference between Sieverts, uh, Greys, you know, uh, Rankins, these different ways of measuring the levels of radiation. It's, it's very easy to just shift back and forth through this kind of jargon and basically confuse people so that ultimately what they just have to do is take on trust what your conclusions are. Um, but that's a strategy. That's a strategy to manage public anxiety. One of the things I wanted to yeah. mention too, just about the that article, Born Violent, is as an illustration, the you know, when they push the atoms for peace, the idea that we could use this to generate electricity, uh, people began to build uh, nuclear power plants for contributing to the electrical grid around the world. The first one of which, by the way, was built in the Soviet Union. But the first American power plant that was used to generate electricity was in Shipping Port, Pennsylvania. And it was the 14th nuclear power plant built in the United States. We already had 13 nuclear power plants in the United States, but they only produced plutonium. They did not make electricity. Oh. So it was not a new thing at wow. all. But it was made to seem like a new thing. Right. The water that holds tritium that's stored at Fukushima in huge tanks. Can you comment on that? What would be... Um, they, ultimately, they have no choice. Right. And it'll happen again and again because there'll be more and more of this water that accrues. They can clean, they can filter out a, a lot of specific radioactive particles, but they can't get the tritium out of it. It's almost impossible to get tritium out of water. So the process that they do, which is, this is, you know, there's a lot of groundwater that goes through, you know, it's a watershed area where the Fukushima plants are, and it's at the bottom of a hill. Um, and so underneath the plants where the melted nuclear cores are, there's water going through there all the time. There's water going- To keep it cool. Well, it, that's not so important anymore because okay. it, it's cooled down now, but, just because it's flowing through, just because it's, oh. it's groundwater that's flowing through that area. So they're, site, they're removing all of this water and water that is used for cooling and is stored in tanks. And they can filter out, you know, some of the cesium or strontium or various other uh, radionuclides, but they cannot remove the tritium. 
because um, it's, it's a form of hydrogen, so it's, you can't really filter it out. And uh, so they simply release it into the sea, and then they'll do it again in three or four years when the tanks are full again, and, and that'll go on for a period of time. what's the effect on marine life? And well, it, it, I mean, it's, it's deleterious, it's, it's dangerous, um, but it's widely dispersed, you know, so uh, right now, right now when you, when you think about radiation in the water and you think about uh, effects on marine life in, in, around the Fukushima plants, it's, the radiation levels have really dropped. Uh, near the plants and one of the main reasons is because a lot of the particles that were entering the water right after the event have settled down to the bottom of the sea. Uh, that doesn't mean they go away, it just means that they're not floating around in the water. So um, as long as we don't scrape the bottom for 300 years? Well, it'll still migrate. It'll still get, get taken up in plants and, and sea creatures and eaten by other creatures and it'll slowly bioaccumulate up the food chain. Um, but there's not a huge entry like there was right afterwards. So the highest levels of radiation entering the sea with the largest effects is where the rivers are emptying. Because there's a, as, as you know, there's a large deposit of fallout all across a large section of the, of the region. And so a lot of those particles are in the forests and in the hills. And every time it rains, more of them flush down into the rivers, and where the rivers, the river, and they accumulate in the rivers. And so where the rivers meet the sea, those points are actually significantly they're receiving significantly more uh, particles than the the risks that will happen from returning all that tritium water into the sea. Uh, that will also have some effect on marine life, um, uh, and it, for for any creatures that in turn that that get that tritium inside of their bodies, that's not good for them, but it, it's not likely to have a, a large eroding effect on sea life in general. Um, How about drinking water and safety of those living in the area? Yeah, this is always, every nuclear power plant, there's tritium ends up in the drinking water, even if they operate without accidents. So this is a part of what having nuclear power means, is that there'll be some uh, raising of tritium in drinking water in the area. Um, it's really in, almost impossible to contain it and so and impossible to filter out exactly and so it so it so whereas whereas you can uh, filter out some kinds of waste and that doesn't mean that you that it goes away it just means you have it contained now um, tritium is really really difficult to filter out and so it gets into the ecosystem so around if, nuclear plants. if you did water catchment from rain and mm -hmm. filtered your rain water mm -hmm. would it still be in the rainwater the because of tritium. condensation yeah, yeah. Tritium is, is really, I mean, we can't get it out with, I mean, they would, if there was a way to get it out with filters, if, you know, it'd be out. So even from groundwater or rainwater, it doesn't matter, it's everywhere. It, it's, I mean, it's not everywhere. It's in, it's more in some places than other places. Right. So it, there's, as I said, near, near all, I, I think you could probably say near every nuclear power plant, but certainly near most of them, there's tritium in the groundwater around the plant. And uh, people who live further away will have less than people who live closer. Um, because it because it might it doesn't it's not distributed through the air like the fallout from nuclear testing so it's uh, so it's so it's everybody's not at risk right in a sense but anybody could be at risk right right in your paper um, you talk about the raise of uh, cancer rates yeah. by twelve percent after the Bravo right the mm -hmm. the testing in the Marshall Islands mm -hmm. and how they saw a 12 percent increase in thyroid cancer was it yeah so is that similar to the kinds of increases that maybe it's too soon to tell mm -hmm. but around Fukushima people living in that area or? well you know the the numbers will eventually you know we'll know the numbers in another decade or two of you know how many thyroid cancers were produced but every place that people people think uh, every place where people are exposed to radiation by the deposition of fallout, by fallout coming down. Um, fallout means? Uh, radioactive particles that go up into the air and then are distributed downwind and come back down to the ground. So this is a really critical thing to understand about radiation. And uh, it's really, it, it's really a, a lot of what my work is focused on right now. We experience, we, we can physically experience radiation largely in two different ways. One is as rays, and the other is as particles. 
So when the nuclear weapon exploded here in Hiroshima, there's a burst of gamma radiation, huge burst of gamma radiation. That radiation is in the form of rays, and it goes through everything. It goes through buildings, it goes through your entire body. It's similar to an X-ray, um, but it doesn't last long. It lasted about a minute, so there's this huge burst of radiation. It basically uh, largely dissipated by the time it was three kilometers away from the bomb, but the closer you were to the detonation, the higher the level of gamma radiation. The further away you were, the lower the level of gamma radiation. But it, it would go through everything. Um, now that presents a certain kind of danger to the body. Uh, it can damage cells all through your body. If you receive a high amount, it can kill you in minutes or hours or days or weeks. Um, but the other thing that happens when a nuclear weapon explodes, but also in other times, is that in, that, in the mushroom cloud, here in Hiroshima, that mushroom cloud is sucking up all kinds of particles from the ground. They're moving up into the cloud and the fires are releasing all kinds of particles. And a lot of those things are ionized. They're particles that, there's the, the radioactive material like the uranium or the plutonium of a weapon, uh, but there's a lot of other particles that are produced in the explosion and then other particles that are made radioactive in a sense by the chemical experience that they have. So all of these particles rise up into the cloud. This is why the cloud mushrooms out. It's filling up with particles. And then all of that stuff is up in the air. So like any cloud, it'll then start to drift. And as it drifts, those particles will fall back down. Uh, that's fallout. Um, and that kind of radiation that we experience in that form is in the form of particles. It's not in the form of rays. So things may only be dangerous for a few hours or a few days. Other things like cesium-137 will be dangerous for 300 years. Plutonium will be dangerous for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, Uranium-235 for a billion years. So it just depends on the particle. It's a specific chemical. Once those distribute, they're just like any chemical. They are now in the ecosystem and they migrate through the ecosystem because chemicals are used. So the danger to us is that we get them inside of our body. And if we get them inside of our body, even one particle, it could pass through our body, we could excrete it, but it could also be kept by the body. So it depends on the chemical nature of it. So for example, iodine, if we get iodine-131, which is the radioactive type of iodine, our body uses iodine in the thyroid gland. Uh, when we eat food, our body takes the iodine and puts it in the thyroid gland. And so if you have iodine-131 in your body, your body may say, ah, iodine, and put it in the thyroid gland. Um, chemicals like strontium-90 uh, are uh, analogous to calcium. So when it's in the body, the body goes, oh, uh, calcium, and it puts it in the bones or it puts it in the teeth. So if you hang on to this particle, if your body hangs on to this particle, the level of radiation it gives off is not high, but it's sitting at a place in your body and it's irradiating the cells around it 24 hours a day. And if it's cesium, it's for longer than you will live. So for the rest of your life, until you, unless you pass it out of you, it will be irradiating the cells right around it. So it will develop diseases and cancers, immune system disorders, other things, but more slowly than if you get a giant burst of radiation. Uh, well, what happened in Fukushima is more like what happened where the people who experienced black rain is. Nobody was so close the, there's high levels of gamma radiation at the reactor, at the core of the reactor, but it's just the workers who are near that. So they have risk from that. The people who live outside of, who, who live far from the plant, their risk comes from the fallout. Their risk because there were, there were explosions that carried lots of particles up into the air. Those drifted and came down mostly to the northwest. So you'll see these maps of radiation that show this streak. That's basically where the cloud deposited particles. Once those particles come down, they're part of the ecosystem there now. And so they will migrate through the ecosystem. And this is why it's, it's kind of impossible to clean it up. Because if you have a giant area, forested mountainous area, with lots of particles, you can't take one little spot and somehow clean it and it remains clean if it's surrounded by these particles. Every time it rains, when the wind blows, more particles will migrate downward, migrate into the town. So you can decontaminate it for a short period of time, but because it's embedded in an ecosystem with other that's rich with radionuclides, those radionuclides will eke back in. Um, so those present a different kind of danger to us than the danger people experience in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we have 
far less understanding. It's far more difficult to medically predict the outcomes because the particles are distributed irregularly. Different people, if there's 10 people sitting here, three of us might have gotten a particle in us. Right. Seven didn't. We don't know which three those are. Which is really interesting, because like when they had the evacuation zone, it's all a perfect circle. Yeah, the, the evacuation zones are based on the notion of gamma rays, that there's a source in the middle. And so what was the so what was the middle? It was the plants. That's where the gamma rays were coming from. But it's, it, so our responses and a lot of the infrastructure we've built about how to understand risk from radiation and how to respond to radioactive events have to do with the notion of a nuclear explosion. That there's a place that the radiation is coming from and you need to move people away from that. But the fallout is completely irregular. There's places inside those cir evacuation circles with less radiation than places 50 kilometers outside because of how the cloud distributed the particles. And how the wind patterns are. And, and, and once they come down, then they continue to migrate. And so what happened in Fukushima is much closer to what happened to uh, communities near test sites. So for example, in the Marshall Islands. Uh, so the disease presentation that we'll see in Fukushima is almost certain to mirror the presentation from people who experience a lot of fallout rather than what happened to people who got a lot of gamma radiation like the Hibakusha in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Right. Everything is so important and so interesting, but it must be overwhelming too. Yeah. yeah. Do you, I mean, isn't it? Absol how, absolutely. How can you this stay is, positive? And this is one of the reasons that I talked about how after, if you're a dark tourist, you need to have a nice dinner. Yeah. Um, it's uh, to do to do work on things like this. It's really important to do self care. So especially after Fukushima, a lot of people became really involved and activists around the nuclear issue. And, uh, and one of the bits of advice I gave them was every day, take a walk, have a nice meal, have a glass of wine with friends, spend, uh, spend a little time talking with people you care about. Every day, make sure you have some joy in your life. Every day, it's the only way to continue to do this work. If you just focus all of the time on these dark things, you'll burn out and you'll, you'll have to walk away after four or five years. So uh, my, my research colleague uh, from Australia, Mick Broderick, who I've done a lot of my field research with, one of the ways he puts it is, put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put the oxygen mask on others. Right, like the airplane. Exactly, and so it's similar to, uh, you know, my wife is a psychotherapist, so our days are strangely similar. I'm spending my day looking at all of these dark historical events and, uh, and cynical or cruel governmental policies or corporate policies that harm people, uh, she's sitting with individuals and she's hearing from individuals dark things that happened to them, you know, hard parts of their childhood or things, traumas they may have suffered. And at the end of the day, we're both in the same place, which is we need to turn away from our work and we need to be silly people who have a little bit of fun. And, you know, it, I'm sure it's similar for uh, medical professionals who have to deal with people dying or being injured. Uh, it's an essential part of being able to function over the long term with this kind of work is dropping it, finding yeah. a way to stop, uh, to stop having it eat at you. And so it's really important to cultivate happiness in your daily life. That's true for all of us, yeah. but it's definitely true if you, if you want to work on, on things, that are, things that are emotionally painful. That's so true. It's so important to continue having the energy and enthusiasm for it. It's, it's the only way you can do it for decades. You, you can't, I mean, you could, you could become an activist around an issue that outrages you and you can yell and yell and scream and, and try to force change. Uh, but if that's all you're doing and you're not stopping and also realizing that the world's a beautiful place full of wonderful people, um, you burn out. That, that's why people talk about burnout. So if you, if you want to do this kind of work for decades, you have to learn how to structure in self-care and yeah. uh, remind, ways to remind yourself of what's wonderful about yeah. this planet and the people who live here. Definitely. It's, the tentative title is Nuclear Bodies. Uh -huh. Radioactive decay of self and planet, self, community, and planet. Um, when, when are you expecting? No pressure. Next, <laughs> next year. Next year? Yeah. Wow, it, I should be done with the manuscript by summer, and uh -huh. then it's got to go through peer review and revision.
really the fruit of about 10 years of work. Wow. So one of the one of the central arguments of the book is that looking at all of the you know the work that I do is work on global hibakusha. So this is the people exposed to radiation after 1945. Right. Or, or besides the people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So people who live near uranium mines and people who live near nuclear test sites or near Hanford or accident sites like Chernobyl or Fukushima. And, uh, and so one of, one of the, looking at the impacts on these communities, looking at all the different impacts on these communities from the health problems to the anxieties of not knowing if you get sick or not. If you know, if you live in a contaminated place, you don't know if you'll get sick or if you won't get sick or if you've internalized particles or not. And so, just like Hibakusha here, you know, every time your child runs a fever, you could think this is it. You know, it, it, it's coming to get me. So this anxiety is one of the impacts too. People who have been removed from their homes because of contamination. People have been left to live in contaminated areas, and. Uh, so part of the argument that I make is that the Cold War was a limited nuclear war. Uh, we think the Cold War didn't happen because it didn't happen to us. We had this model of the Cold War war being a big giant nuclear war, but what ended up happening was thousands of nuclear weapons were detonated in tests, many of them so big that they spread radiation over huge areas outside of the test sites, and ultimately millions of people were affected. And so for the people in the Marshall Islands, for the people in Kazakhstan, the Cold War was not a Cold War, it was a hot war. And so it's because the people who were affected are mostly marginal people in colonial or post-colonial spaces or in marginal communities. Um, and because they were, in a sense, people who were considered to be expendable by the people who, by governments that put test sites near their homes. Um, for them, the Cold War was a limited nuclear war. Uh, ultimately, you have, you know, areas of, you have communities that have to be abandoned. You have people who've suffered all kinds of health problems. Statistically, during the Cold War, a nuclear weapon was being detonated every 8.6 days. So that's not a period of time in which nuclear weapons weren't used. It's a time when nuclear weapons were used. They were not used in direct attacks on people. But because of the nature of fallout, some of these ways I've been talking about how people are impacted by fallout, there were substantial effects on millions of people in sites all around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, they remain invisible to us, and it's a disservice to them, and it's a disservice to our own history and to what our own governments did to pretend that didn't happen. of radiation exposures. A lot of people in Fukushima experienced that same thing. You know, people people who were evacuating the region, other prefectures, uh, people didn't want to put gas in their cars because they think the cars are contaminated. Kids who have moved from Fukushima have been bullied. Um, it, it's a it's a common thing and it's it's rooted in fear of contamination. You know, radiation is really difficult to understand. People don't necessarily understand that if somebody was exposed to radiation, it's no, there's no threat to you. Instead, this person can be seen to be like potentially someone with the coronavirus. So our, the reactions of, a, an instinctive reaction of a lot of people is repulsion from somebody you believe may be, may be uh, contaminated. And there's diff so just in a visceral sense, in, in the immediate aftermath of things like that, people are really shunned in a sense. But because of how hard it is to understand radiation and because one of the things people did understand was that it can do genetic damage, people were afraid to have children with, uh, with hibakusha. Um, people thought hibakusha are people who are going to get sick more often or going to be fatigued more, so you don't want to hire them because they're not going to be as productive as another worker. They're going to have to take more time away than another worker. Um, and of course, just like for any population of people, that's true for some people and not true for some people, but it's easy to fear. And part of when we were talking earlier about how easy it is to not to be confused about radiation, it just facilitates that. Yeah. It's this magic thing that somehow has disrupted this person's life and you just, you know, you just think it's better to stay away from it. Right. So that happens to people everywhere that have been exposed to radiation, people who survived Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, even when I travel outside of Japan and I say I'm living in Hiroshima, you get that immediate reaction. Yeah. 
where people physically move back from you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they wonder, is it okay to live there? Yeah. Is it all right? You know, it's amazing. We have tourism here, to be honest. Yeah. That people want to come and are okay drinking the water and... Absolutely. And eating the delicious Hiroshima food. Yes. Because <laughs> it is delicious. Um, is, there, is there any concern to, for visitors to Hiroshima? No. Um, as I said, there's more radiation present in Hiroshima from global nuclear testing than there is from the 1945 attack. And so that will be true of wherever the visitor lives, as well as it's true for Hiroshima. Or anywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world. And so Even there's... Even Galapagos or... Absolutely. Desert islands would still have it. Absolutely. You bet. In Patagonia, the southern tip of South America, in the 1950s, people had traces of radiation in their body. Because when the fallout goes into the stratosphere, it then can d distribute globally and come down anywhere, <coughs> not nearby. Um, so there's no, there's absolutely no increase in risk to tourists coming here uh, at all. It's been fantastic talking to you. Thank you so much both. Oh, my pleasure, Joy. And a fantastic location. Yes, it's been fantastic having our other participant. Yes. This beautiful building. The silent storyteller behind yes, us. Yes, exactly. Right?